but you you have been a revolutionary for 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 real i mean i i i i was uh, doing some research on you if you don't mind so i i tracked your uh, you <laughs> didn't find the pictures I from tracked 5 your, years ago did you? your twitter account and was looking for some some controversial stuff that you you've written so you 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 said that edward Snowden has a firm conscience, but has balls of steel. So, a revolutionary fellow, but, uh, but is that something that you felt when we were starting Jawbone? Did you feel that you had balls of steel? <laughs> I was thinking more platinum. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> thank you for picking, thank you for finding I mean, that one tweet. I mean, by the way. That's, that's you saying it. So. <laughs> What does it take? I mean, you, are, you came up with this product that was, comp uh, in, in, that was going to compete with already massive businesses that were established, and you go out there and keep at it. I know you got rejected many times by funders, but you still got, get at it, and you, you become a leading edge company on a global basis. There's, a, there's an aspect of irrationality, um, and I think some of that is being naive. I think some of it is also having maybe subconsciously or even consciously having feeling like you have no choice but to do what it is you're doing, either because you believe in the vision or because you literally are like, I don't think I can go and work for the companies that I'm technically qualified to go work for and what, wakes me, what gets me up in the morning. And I think that's actually a critical question. What gets you up in the morning? What stops you from hitting snooze? So what got you up in the morning? Well, it was a, you know, it was a vision for how people interacted with their devices um, that I had um, when I was finishing Stanford. You're an engineer. I was an engineer. Uh, Hussein was an engineer as well. And when I finished my, my undergrad and, and started doing my grad school, I was working on some stuff around human interaction. And Hussein came up to me and says, if you start a company around this, um, we should do it together. And uh, we ruminated on it for about a year. And um, both of us had a little bit of this sense of irrationality, perhaps, not knowing what we didn't know. You know, we both studied mechanical engineering. We started a business doing signal processing. I mean, none of us had any clue. And it's not having a clue, but having a vision and having perseverance that often takes you on a path where you're exploring, you're opening doors that people have forgotten to open or discovering new doors that people didn't even know were there. So you discover solutions that people didn't know were there. And so as a result... And you didn't know they were there. We had no clue. I mean, I was surprised when we, when we came up with the things we'd came up with. Um, and, and uh, you know, we can philosophize about this. I do think that, that we do shape our future, and I think that entrepreneurs with perseverance, and I don't mean entrepreneurs in, the, in a very kind of rigid sense of the Silicon Valley model. I mean anyone with a passion for an idea and a perseverance to go and achieve it do shape the future. Uh, I don't think the future is set. I think futurism as a discipline is a bit silly because the people who shape the future are the people doing it, not the people talking about it. And um, I think that was the case for Jawbone. So we ended up being two unqualified founders, um, hiring a couple of, a ragtag crew of scientists and engineers, um, and coming up with, as Hussein mentioned yesterday, a technology that um, uh, was a step change in performance for voice quality uh, that hadn't occurred for 30 years. Um, and this was, incidentally, to show you how, how, much, how much sometimes revolution is something that is not immediately obvious right. to, the, to the existing um, powers that be. We dangled this technology in front of our biggest competitors, because at the time, you know, we were a little crew of 10 people in a loft in San Francisco. We were constantly struggling to get funding. No one wanted to fund core tech in those days. We went to Nokia, we went to Motorola, um, Plantronics, Jabra, people who were building um, a lot of the body-worn communications devices at the time. And we dangled our technology in front of them. And they're like, oh, no, it's great. It's the Rolls Royce, blah, da, 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 da. But it's too costly. Sorry. Um, we'll take it off you for free, and we'll hire half your team. But, um, so it's amazing to what extent um, you can show people the journey you're on. You can give them evidence that you're going to succeed, potentially, and they still don't get it. But, but that's a rejection that was in your favor. I mean, that's, that's, amazing. Like, that's like failure that actually makes it. Yeah. I mean, that's, 
that's the best failure that can happen because when you, you would have gone somewhere else if if Jobo if uh, if Jabra said yes, I wanna I wanna do that with you. Every and yeah, you, would, you, would, you wouldn't be sitting here. Every right? wrong door that is closed on you takes you one step closer to the door that is good for so you. So what does that do to you though? So I mean, does does when you go to all these guys that tell you you know it looks good, it's whatever Rolls Royce, there's no market for it. So what does that do to your brain? I mean, I, 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 how does that re, re, rewire you? What, what, what do you do then? Do you do, you know, I want to go prove them wrong? Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm on a mission here? Uh, or do you go incremental in other areas? I mean, do, do, or do you go home and get depressed and, and uh, write blogs from your mother's basement? <laughs> Loft. <laughs> um, metaphorically speaking, I think that's when you develop, you know, Metaphorically speaking, bigger balls. I think that that's the, 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 yes. the football. You move from from copper to bronze or whatever it is. Um, <laughs> I think, um, yeah, I think that rejection is an opportunity to strengthen one's resolve. Um, not always. I think that I think it's a bit naive also to think that you know. Um, you know Rejection should always make you stronger. It's also feedback. It's also helping you refine how, you know, for instance, if, if a big company says, if a big company says, we don't want your technology, but we think it's great, we're not gonna, we can't pay you anything for it. It's a way of saying you're onto something, but you haven't quite understood where the value lies. Right. Well, um, that's how you read it. Well, that's how it's I read it. not what necessarily they told you. They told you, you know, go home. Yeah. But you said, okay, they don't really go, mean go home. Go find a different way of doing it. But that's because your brain is positive? I mean, what, what is it? I mean, that's what, that yeah, because there's you were a on a mission? Yeah, I you, think you were a, a real deep believer in this and said they know, they know nothing about what, the, what, what this thing is about? Yeah, we thought they were idiots. So you, uh, you went back and said, yes! Rejection is excellent. Now let's see how we can. No, the we world. we didn't think that initially because I think we were we were we were whether no, no matter how different we thought we were, we were still raised in an environment that um, caused us to be respectful of establishment. Oh, that's we're gonna, not respectful. We're going to go not... meet the CEO of a two billion dollar company, or we're going to meet the head of the CTO of so, TI. I mean, these were big things in those days. When you're 25 years old, you're like. It was like the biggest thing. We like flew down to Dallas to meet with, you know, that was a big deal. And then you realize that it's not a, such a big deal um, and that actually um, we know more than they do about the journey that we're on and therefore we need to take what we can and keep and that's moving. that's like what? That's like uh, an inspiration that suddenly comes and says, well, you know, the fact that they reject us doesn't mean that they know more. Yeah. I mean, that's a sense of confidence that's incredible for a 25, 26 year old that says, you know, these established guys don't know much and I am. I mean, is this, this, this is a it didn't sense. feel. You it didn't, are not it, respecting establishment while you said you are respecting I, establishment. I appreciate you saying that. Entrepreneurs don't respect establishment. They are in the business of disruption. Yes, they're in the. They're, Whether they know it or not. They it's go rebellion. out and say, this doesn't look good. Let's just it's throw a, it out. And I think going back to the theme of today, I think there's an aspect of, of, of rebellion. There's an aspect of rewriting the rules um, that is, intrinsically disruptive or intrinsically uncomfortable for the people who benefit from the existing rules. I mean, that's fundamentally um, the great challenge I have with when people, you know, when people talk about creativity. Um, you know, it is to me, if you, if you, I think if you look at the statistics, statistics of this, and if you were able, ever able to gather the statistics of people's meetings with establishment when they're trying to prepare a new idea, I reckon that the best sign that you can ever have is if the establishment doesn't get what you're doing. Because yeah, what that means... Because you're stealth. They don't well, take you seriously. They don't take you seriously. Yeah, he's a young boy, you know, let him go play in the garden. And it's a sign that you've got something that is disruptive, by definition. And that, that's what allows you to actually go out and produce your product because they're not noticing you. 